Corey Tanaik is the campaign manager for the Ontario Progressive Conservatives. He's in Toronto, and look, he's smiling today. No surprise there. Congratulations, Corey. Thank you very much. Listen, it is obviously a big win. I think one of the things folks might wonder about, though, you know, I remember in the midst of the pandemic, people just screaming, absolutely outraged about some of the decisions Doug Ford was making, be it about schools, be it about openings and closures. How can you explain how we got from that moment to such a big win? Well, I, I, I think uh, there are any one moment for any leader going through COVID, uh, you could probably single out as not having been a great moment. There, there, there more are than one. Any time. Uh, well, I think more than one for everyone. But uh, I, I think what shone through and uh, clearly what the election campaign ended up being about was a choice around leadership, as these things often are. And, uh, uh, and the Premier, uh, Premier Ford, got a, a very ringing endorsement. Uh, from the electorate here in Ontario. He expanded his voter coalition. Uh, he, uh, he increased his seat count, increased his popular vote. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, that, that's an indication that obviously uh, a lot more people felt differently than, uh, than what you just suggested. Okay, well, listen, I, I understand why you would point to those numbers, and obviously they're very important numbers for the party. Another big number, though, you know, historic low voter turnout. Are you concerned that almost 60% of eligible voters just stayed home? Well, I, I'm not concerned about that at all. In fact, it's, uh, the two can go uh, hand in hand. You know, generally low voter turnout is uh, indicative of a population that is uh, supportive of the government that's in power. And we certainly saw that. How do you uh, figure? And all the like they didn't, they didn't vote for you, yeah. so how, why support it? Well, well if, you, if you let me answer the question, uh, it's, uh, you know, when you have a change election where you want to see somebody defeated, uh, as we saw in the last election campaign against Kathleen Wynne, that's when you get a record number of people voting. This is true not just for this election, but, you know, as somebody who does this as a, for a living in many different jurisdictions with many different candidates can tell you low voter turnout is uh, runs parallel with uh, general uh, uh, support and comfort with the government that's in power. And when you see high voter turnout, it is invariably connected with a change election where uh, the incumbent is uh, about to get tossed from office. So that's why I say I'm not surprised or concerned by that. You, you know, some folks, they'll see that number and they say this is bad news for democracy. What do you say to them? Well, I, there's some folks who don't like the outcome of any given election and, uh, and they, uh, uh, they make complaints like that. Uh, you know, that's, uh, this is our system. Uh, is, uh, having the ability to vote uh, is not a requirement to vote. People get to make that choice in a free society on their own. And, uh, and as I say, when you see a government that's largely popular uh, uh, relative to the other choices on the ballot, you tend to see voter voter turnout, which is what we saw in this campaign. Do you think accountability and transparency, are those important for democracy, Corey? Yeah, for sure they are. Do you think Doug Ford demonstrated that, uh, given the fact that he said no to a lot of interviews with major networks? You know, you, ha you had candidates who weren't showing up to debates, media chasing uh, Mr. Ford around the province, not always knowing where he was going to show up. Was that accountable and transparent? Okay. Uh, I think he's a very accountable and transparent uh, politician. In fact, I'd say, uh, you know, the most that I've ever worked with or ever seen in, uh, in the history of politics in this country, the man gives out his personal cell phone number, uh, rallies in public events, and takes calls from literally anyone. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's some in the media who like to uh, literally move into the bedroom next to his at home and, you know, talk to him over breakfast every morning, and anything short of that is a lack of media access. But uh, you know, uh, the media are, uh, you know, are an interest group unto themselves uh, to a certain extent and, and unfettered access, uh, uh is, uh, is not, uh, synonymous with, uh, accountability and media access. Like it, you know, uh, he's out many, many times for many press conferences, he did a debate where, you know, uh, professional journalists ask questions and, uh, he got to debate the issues with other party leaders. Uh, there's nothing abnormal about that, you know, uh, but, you know, accountability does not mean that he has to be a guest on your show. Like it just isn't, even if that's good for your ratings. It's just not a requirement. Uh, well, I, listen, I think that we can both agree that there's a pretty big difference into moving between moving into the bedroom next to his and his him agreeing to speak to, for instance, TVO, who has interviewed every major party leader for 50 years, but Doug Ford wouldn't speak to them, right? All, all, seven, all 17 of their viewers, right? Like, it's not, the media landscape has changed enormously. Catherine, you know that. It's why the ratings for, for every channel, including this one, 
are you know uh, a fraction of what they were uh, a generation ago, and and we're, we live in a very different media environment. Uh, we stream, for instance, every campaign event that we have. Uh, you know, it's streamed, and people can tune in uh, at home and. Tens of thousands of people choose that option. In but fact, that, more I would than, say that's different than asking questions. Podcast. But listen, we, I, 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 know, I know you're talking about the media being self-interested. Let's move on from questions about the media and let's talk about another aspect of this uh, campaign. I want to talk about the pandemic for a moment. And this is something like, I have to tell you, Corey, it's something I have wondered about uh, personally over the course of all of this. When we look at what happened in Ontario, more people died in long-term care in the second wave of this pandemic compared to the first. Doug Ford said, you know, he was going to protect people. We're talking about 2,225 people. Doug Ford had said he was going to put an iron ring around long-term care. We had a commission that said that there was just no plan to deal with protecting people in long-term care. Do you think that, do you think, well, no, do you think you paid any political price for that? The voters got to cast their judgment on the government, including a, pan, a record during the pandemic. Uh, but I'll tell you what one of the big differences between you know what people vote for and what you're wanting to talk about right now is elections are invariably about the future more than the past. Mm -hmm. It's about what is it you're putting on offer for, uh, for the province in terms of a vision and a plan for the upcoming four years. And yes, certainly a portion of, of the electorate will, electorate will factor in uh, your record, including your record on the pandemic. Uh, and, uh, and that's a very comparative uh, uh, endeavor, you know, and you've seen some politicians who that's gone not so well for, and you've seen others like Premier Ford that have gotten reelected handily. So, you know, the, you don't have to like the judgment of the public, but the judgment of the public is pretty transparently there. We want a larger majority with more seats, with more popular vote. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, that says that the, the public was by and large, uh, on balance, happy with our management of the pandemic, and by and large, uh, felt uh, our plan and our leadership uh, and the leadership of Premier Ford going forward is, uh, is, is you know, the, the better of, of uh, the four options put before them in this campaign. A lot of people are talking about the idea that he's now the most powerful conservative in the country. Are there lessons for, for instance, the federal conservatives who are having a race right now, or is this just like the Doug Ford effect? something specific to him? Well, certainly there's a portion of our support that doesn't doesn't uh, easily uh, transfer to another leader or another party at a different level. Um, you know, w one of the big advantages that uh, Premier Ford has uh, over uh, other leaders uh, in, you know, in, in conservative parties uh, or people who have run uh, in conservative parties here in the province is uh, a personal brand and uh, a record in municipal politics through both his, his brother and himself, where uh, they have a support base that's uh, not, you know, that, that of constituents who, you know, have seen them up close. So if you're looking at uh, places like Etobicoke, North York and Scarborough, um, uh, those are Ford victories. Those are, are, are victories that you can associate very closely mm -hmm. with the personal brand of the leader. But I would say, you know, the uh, biggest change in this election versus last one, uh, and one of the reasons why our seat count went up is, uh, you know, he had unprecedented support uh, from organized labor in, uh, in the province. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, and that came directly off the bottom of the NDP's uh, tally, if you will. Uh, this is uh, hundreds of thousands of people who uh, are, are union members, mostly in private sector uh, unions, uh, who, uh, uh, who for the first time ever, their organization supported our party. You know, that's uh, that's very, very big news, and I think it's a fundamental rethinking of a conservative coalition. And I think it would be wise for uh, conservative leaders elsewhere across the country uh, and nationally to to look at that very closely, because mm -hmm. I, I think those are are uh, voters that have uh, a very uh, tangible reason to to make that switch from the traditional NDP support to. Uh, uh, to a conservative party. Mm -hmm. you know, and it's interesting because it is something Aaron O'Toole tried to do and obviously didn't have the level of success that you did. The last question, Corey, and I'm way over time here. I know I'm making the folks in the control room sweat. Uh, you think there's any chance that uh, Premier Ford is going to endorse someone in the federal uh, conservative leadership now that the election's over? Or will you, for that matter? Uh, well, uh, my, my hope is to come back and join you guys on CBC and uh, chat with you more regularly. Uh, I, I, I don't think I'll be supporting anyone. I'd be surprised if the, the premier uh, does. It's uh, sort of unlike him. If, uh, But uh, I'll, I'll let him make his own decisions. <laughs>
Okay, listen, uh, Corey, once again, congratulations, a decisive victory. We appreciate you making time to talk to us about it today. Corey Tonight. Great. Always a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.